everyone and welcome. I'm Susan Chekalu Signan, and I'm Director of Marketing and Program Development for the Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library. FFRPL raises funds, presents programs, supports special projects, helps to create specialized spaces, and purchases supplemental materials and equipment for the Rochester Public Library. Welcome to Book Sandwiched In. We have a wonderful lineup this season, and we're absolutely delighted to be back here for this in-person program. We ask that you please silence your cell phones at this time. Our thanks go to those who help fund programs like these through FFRPL, the dedicated, dedicated FFRPL committee members who curate and organize these events, our guest speakers and artists who so graciously share their time and talents, the library staff who help with our setup and production, and the thousands of people who attend each year. A little bit of housekeeping, we are requiring advanced registration for BSI this fall and spring. Um, we email the registration link to our subscribers and we also post it to our website, ffrpl.org, where you can also sign up to receive our e-newsletters if you aren't already on our list. Of course, you're welcome to call or email us if you need assistance with the registration process. We'll continue to limit capacity and have socially distanced seating for everyone's comfort. Masking is not currently required at the library at this time. We will be posting the events with closed captioning to the RPL YouTube channel at Rochester Public Library, New York, about a week or so after each review. To access the induction loop in the auditorium, please set your hearing aid to the T switch. And thank you for helping to make it possible for us to present in-person events while keeping everyone safe during the ongoing pandemic. National Library Week is April 4th through the 9th, and FFRPL is having two book sales to benefit the library. You can browse and buy at our on-site book sale this week and next week, Monday through Friday, just outside the auditorium by the library store. And our online book sale runs on biblio.com from April 3rd through April 9th. You can get 10% off of books priced $100 and up, and proceeds from sales here at Central and online benefit the Rochester Public Library. And you can visit our website, ffrpl.org, for a list of programs being held in celebration of National Library Week, including Erigami's installation of a 25-foot balloon dragon in Harold Hacker Hall. Yes. Today's review is of the book Quantum Life, My Unlikely Journey from the Street to the Stars by Hakim Oleski and Joshua Horwitz. Our reviewer is Dr. Casey Miller, Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Affairs and Professor in RIT's College of Science. Dr. Miller serves as Associate Dean for Research and Faculty Affairs and Professor in the College of Science at the Rochester Institute of Technology. He's an experimental physicist focusing on nanoscale magnetic materials and related devices. He's also recognized for his work exploring methods for transforming recruitment, admissions, and retention to increase access and inclusion for underrepresented groups in STEM graduate programs. In 2018, Dr. Miller attained a collaborative award from the National Science Foundation to improve the STEM ecosystem and develop the Inclusive Graduate Education Network, or iGen, alliance with colleagues from the American Physical Society, the American Chemical Society, and the University of Southern California. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Miller to our podium. Thank you. Thanks. Can you hear me all right? I have this, uh, this ear thing on, but I don't know if it's working. Is it working? You good? OK, thank you. Hi, I'm Casey Miller. Uh, I, uh, uh, as, as Susan mentioned, have been working in, in physics and in, uh, in equity issues for a very long time. Uh, so I was, I was uh, uh, pleased to uh, get the invitation to come speak to you all today uh, about, about this book. Uh, um, and in case you haven't read it yet, I'll just give you a brief summary of what, what this is about. It's about, the, uh, uh, about uh, Hakim Alawesehi, who grew up in uh, Mississippi. Actually, he grew up all over the place. Every year he moved, 
uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but he basically uh, was a brilliant kid put, growing up in, in different situations that didn't allow him to, to ex excel the way that you might in a stable environment. And so he uh, went through a variety of issues re related to, uh, to drug use, drug dealing, et cetera, throughout his entire career. Uh, and these things set him up uh, for a variety of, of uh, successes and failures, as you might imagine. Um, and ultimately, he made it through, uh, through all of this and became a PhD level physicist, graduating from Stanford University, which is one of the top physics universities in the country, or in the world, in fact. So um, I, thank you for the invitation. And I'm gonna give you um, kind of my spin on what I, what I see in this book. It's not gonna be a necessarily a chapter by chapter accounting of what's going on in the book, but from my perspective, um, themes that I've picked out as I read this book. And um, it's a very simple read. I don't remember the total number of pages, it's like 340 some odd pages maybe, but there's 83 chapters. So it's, we're talking about four or five, maybe eight pages per chapter, okay? So it's, it's pretty simple. Um, I have found out since, uh, since working on this review that it was also picked up for a movie. Uh, so if you're interested in this kind of uh, thing, then uh, you should read it. So uh, this is a little bit difficult to read, but this is the very first, I don't know if you noticed, but I have all these post-it notes. I ran out of post-it notes. Um, but uh, the very first one I put was this quote here. And he's talking about uh, it, basically an epiphany that he had when he was about 10 or so. That's when I realized you could be smart and ignorant at the same time. There were plenty of smart folks on Kelly Hill, including my parents and Aunt Mitty, but because they'd never had formal schooling, because they seemed almost afraid of books, they didn't know about all the things going on and on and on in every direction across time and across the world. So this was, so he grew up with an encyclopedia. So he just read the encyclopedia over and over again. So this was uh, on, in a moment when he was trying to explain World War II to his, to his parents, right? So, um, I'm gonna go through now and, and show you, I'm gonna come back to that quote. I put it up there because it was the very first quote, but it's also, for me, one of the most piercing quotes throughout the entire book, uh, when, you, when you apply it throughout the, what I see here. So throughout the book, there's also subtle examples of, of what we call systemic and institutionalized racism. Uh, and they're everywhere in this book. That's what most of those post-it notes are. He doesn't actually come out and claim these things necessarily. He leaves it to you to figure it out. But here are some examples. So educational system inequalities, which are pervasive everywhere, especially in the South or in urban environments. By, by fourth grade, whoop, greater. By fourth grade, they had separated the students into, th into four tiers. And it turned out all the black students were in the lowest two tiers, right? So, and that was because of the presumed outcomes that, that would, uh, would happen for these individuals in that educational environment. He ultimately joined the Navy right out of school so that he could have more money than anyone in his family has ever had in their lives. But he in high school didn't learn algebra. So the t Navy had to teach him algebra, right? Algebra is, is something we, we take for granted, typically, right? Um, his, his wife, uh, he pointed out at some point when she was in nursing school, he, she wasn't doing well once she had graduated from high school and was in nursing school and was struggling. And he looked at her stuff and realized that she was only writing at a sixth grade level, right? So these folks are set up in a, in a, in a situation where they wouldn't necessarily be successful as they moved on in, in the education system. So he attended Tougaloo College, which is a historically black college uh, in, in the South. Um, it didn't offer quantum mechanics, which is one of the fundamental uh, sub areas of physics. If you don't have quantum mechanics, you will not get into graduate school. So one of the things that I did before I came to RIT was I ran uh, uh, the American Physical Society's bridge program, which tried to identify students that had really a lot of potential, but they didn't have things like quantum mechanics because they went to small colleges or different institutions that just, they didn't have many faculty, so they couldn't teach everything that was expected of them 
for graduate education. So this is a symptom that we see across, uh, across uh, many small colleges, historically black colleges and universities, Hispanic serving institutions, and tribal colleges and universities don't actually offer the full suite of physics uh, that's available. There's also a, a, a description of, of the PhD qualifying exam. So this is something that everybody has to go through before they earn their PhD. It's a, uh, a milestone along that pathway. And he recounts how the, uh, there was an uproar about his grade. Uh, the, the, the professors who were just sitting around a table trying to figure out who passed that year changed the goalposts on him. They changed the, 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 the passing level so that he would not pass, right? Um, and, and then the, the, the uh, consultation that he got after that was that he should start looking for a job now so that next time he failed, that he would have a job to uh, go to, right? So then this, again, this comes back as the, the presumed, uh, uh, the, the implicit assumption that this individual is not gonna make it, right? Uh, and one of the things that I work on that, he, that, that showed up in this very, very briefly is, is, is about admissions requirements. How do you even get into a PhD program? Well, one of the main factors is something called the GRE. It's a standardized test, similar to the SAT or the ACT, but it's used for graduate education. So here I'm showing you uh, data from the company that makes the GRE. Uh, what you're looking at on the y-axis is the GRE quantitative score, so it's a math test. Uh, for students who want to go to graduate education, go, go to graduate school in the physical sciences, math, physics, uh, uh, chemistry, et cetera. And so what you're looking at here are summaries of, of score distributions. So the, you imagine a bell-shaped curve coming out of the board at you. So the tick is the median, and the upper quartile is there, and the bottom quartile is there, right? So um, this is something that, that I've worked on for quite a while, and, and one of the things that some of my colleagues did in the, in the physics discipline is they looked at what the top PhD programs in the country were using for admissions. And it was this red bar. About a third of the physics PhD programs in the country used that red bar as a minimum acceptable score for admission. Now, um, that's by policy. You can go to their web pages and read this, right? What most people don't know is that what you're looking at here across the x-axis is race and gender. So as a result of these institutional policies, this is Puerto Rican, this is African American, these are Native Americans, these are Mexican Americans, this is other Hispanic, white, Asian, women and men. So as a result of these policies for admission, there's a physics uh, diversity problem, right? That's one, one piece of the problem, but it's a piece of the problem. So he mentions this, he doesn't actually go into his specific GRE scores, probably because they weren't great, um, and the funny thing is the GRE only, it only tests math up to sec a second course in algebra. But despite all of these things, these race and gender gaps that we see on these tests do not bear out anything in the outcomes of the students once they're in graduate school. So I'm showing you here the score distribution, or sorry, the, uh, the distribution of, of time to earn your PhD for men and women, they're exactly the same. You might assume, as many, physics, many, many physicists do, if somebody has a low score on the, on the GRE, it's gonna take them longer to graduate. Not true. You might also assume that, that the, the, your graduate GPA is somehow related to your, to your score uh, on, on the test. You can draw a line through those data, right? You can make a program fit that to a line, but you all know that that's a scatter plot right there with not much trend. The statistics follow that. Another issue that I see here is, um, is the limited cultural humility in the physics as a discipline on display throughout the entire book. So what is cultural hum humility? Uh, this is a process of, of reflection and lifelong inquiry involving self-awareness of personal and cultural biases as well as awareness and sensitivity to significant cultural issues of others. Right, so if you have cultural sensitivity, you're more willing to interact with people who are not like yourself, make it a, a, a pleasant place for them to exist. That doesn't happen in physics. Uh, this is a, 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 
National Academy study called uh, Graduate STEM Education for the 21st Century, which is gonna talk, is, talks about some of the things I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak to here in a moment. This was produced in 2018. There's a thing called intersectionality. That's a real issue. Intersectionality is when somebody has two different identities, like being uh, a, a black person and a physicist. So in the, uh, in the, in the book, he talks about being, feeling safe and accepted in his lab by his, his peers. But then when he walks out on the street, people driving by yell racial slurs at him. That's something that, that our friends who are underrepresented deal with on a daily basis. But we don't, as a discipline in physics or a program, necessarily acknowledge that and speak to our underrepresented students in ways to help them work through that. Imposter syndrome is something else, else that, that shows up a lot, which is you know, the, you, you're always feeling like you don't actually belong in this environment. Uh, and so he talks about uh, the well actually guy. And if you've ever talked to a physicist, you might have run into this guy. So <laughs> they always are correcting you on something. Well, actually, it's a little bit different than what you said, right? Um, and then there are lots of other uh, feelings of inadequacy that come out through, through subtleties uh, in interactions with, with folks about your preparation and where, where you went to school and these kinds of things. Which then speaks to a thing called sense of belonging, which is a real issue. Studies have shown that most students leave graduate school for non-academic reasons. People are qualified, they can do it, but they bounce out for reasons like sense of belonging. They don't feel like they belong anymore. Uh, and that, that was one of the things that this, this uh, National Academies report called out for the first time, was it was disciplinary cultures, the lived experiences of individuals that are causing them to leave and causing the perpetual underrepresentation of certain groups in, in STEM education. Uh, and, and he notes this in many places. One example is, is one quote here is that he had to uh, put up with the petty humiliation of his classmates continuously. There's a particularly annoying story in there about uh, uh, not letting him join their working groups. Racism is real, and our students have to deal with this. Unbreakable rule number one, he mentions on page 141. Unbreakable rule number one is never approach a white girl. As he grew up in Mississippi, and he says there, he's, he's 10 years older than me, right? We're talking about a, a guy who grew up in the 80s, not in the 50s, right? And, and, and he said, you, you don't talk to white girls because that's how people get killed in his neck of the woods. This issue about moving the goalpost on the qualifying exam, and then and then uh, many, you know, this is uh, this quote here is something that, that people have maybe have heard is that to be accepted by whites as an equal, a black man had to prove himself twice as good. So by the time he actually graduated, he ended up with 13 publications and was lead author on eight of those. We tenure people for that; we don't give them PhDs. Right, at RIT at least. So how did he succeed amongst all these issues? Well, uh, there's a guy called Bill Sedlicek who believes that, that a lot of what we see here is, is related to uh, what are called non-cognitive competencies. The, the system is designed to measure certain things. It misses lots of other things, right? And so some examples of these are positive self-concept. Uh, and there, he exudes posit positive self-concept -con throughout the entire book. Um, a realistic self-appraisal, where you clearly uh, and realistically delineate your strengths and weaknesses. He understood when he got to Stanford that he went to a, a college that had different level of expectation, and therefore he had to take several years, two years of undergraduate courses in order to be at the level to be successful. Um, and then working on self-development, as he, he worked, um, he had, uh, uh, several um, run-ins with drugs and had to combat that, right? That takes real effort. And then there's non-traditional learn learning. So uh, demonstrating deep expertise in an area. When he was 10, he learned Einstein's theory of special relativity. He read the Bible to the point that uh, at, at age 10, he was called up on stage uh, to deliver the sermon 
for the entire congregation where he was, which is probably going to be the best uh, episode in the, uh, in the movie. Uh, <laughs> and then he did independent research. He taught himself to program on the school computer and then ended up winning the state science fair by demonstrating Einstein's special relativity. Right? So, so, and, and lots of self-taught skills. He became an, uh, 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 a world-class uh, tubist, playing tuba, uh, and, 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 and so on. So he was a beneficiary of change efforts uh, that, that existed back then, and they continue now. Uh, but back then, it was, it, they were sort of targeted efforts to broaden participation, but they're self-funded typically by rich universities. So he was brought into Stanford because they wanted to do something good. Uh, this has moved to a whole lot of, uh, th that situation in the 80s or 90s has moved into more formal things called bridge to the doctorate programs, where students have lots of potential. They don't have all the, all the things they need, so we bring them in and give them the, fill the gaps that they have. Uh, and so I ran this one in, uh, uh, started in 2013, and now I am uh, running this NSF Includes Alliance. Uh, which is now expanded out of physics to include chemistry, geosciences, material science, and, and astronomy. So a lot, of, a lot of this is related to how do we uh, look at, at our students, uh, and, and how can we, how can we as in, in the system, which has, has perpetuated the uh, uh, gaps between achievement by race, how can we mitigate that? Well, one way to do that is to use a holistic review approach, where you're not just looking at test scores, you're not just looking at grades, you're getting in there deeply to understand the individual and the uh, circumstances from which they came. Uh, so this means you have to be comprehensive, you have to look at all sorts of things, what did they do, what kind of potential do they have, are they aligned with your institution? That's a really big one. A lot of students leave because they're not really aligned with what your program is trying to do. Um, and, and then these um, non-cognitive or social-emotional competencies. One thing we, we often don't do is actually state out loud, we're interested in diversity. That's something that we need to do, and we need to integrate that into, into our review processes. Things have to be contextualized. You have to understand the societal patterns. You have to understand where people are coming from and whether or not they had actually access to undergraduate opportunities or high school opportunities in order for them to be successful. Opportunities are not distributed uniformly. And then you have to be systematic. Basing your review on, on shared and predefined criteria, this speaks exactly to the PhD qualifying exam where they changed, the, they changed how they were evaluating it on the fly. Right? That, that's just not acceptable. It's something, not something that should happen. And then you need to build in checks and make sure that you're um, promoting equity and, and limiting your biases by, by being thoughtful and knowing that you might ac accidentally do that. And that's, that's okay. Uh, I'm gonna skip that right now. And then I'm gonna, I'm gonna end here on uh, coming back to this, this quote. That's when I realized you can be smart and ignorant at the same time. The thing that's important for me in this quote is that the irony is palpable to me in this quote because all of the people who are there uh, in, in the Stanford Physics Department, for example, who are putting up barriers to this person, are exhibiting a complete uh, ignorance of his potential to be successful. And that they are complicit, they are actually doing the things that are keeping him and others down. So that, that's an important uh, thing for me to circle back to on that. And it's not just physics, uh, it's everywhere. So this is the Supreme Court uh, Chief Justice Roberts. So he said at one point during deliberations uh, on, uh, on whether or not uh, affirmative action is something that we want to continue in the 2013 or 18, uh, it probably says here, 2013-14. Uh, what unique perspective does a minority student bring to a physics class? And you can find the answer in that book, actually. I gave you some, some notes here. Where he approaches problems differently, he's trained differently, and that, that, that is an asset. Diversity is an asset that lots, allows you to figure out solutions in different ways. Um, Jim Gates is uh, a, 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 a string theorist, hardest discipline in physics. 
Uh, and and he, he says uh, this quote I want to read to you. I take the Chief Justice's question as a serious question asked by someone whose mind is, is looking to work things out and is looking for answers. So I think it's a question that essentially, uh, that essentially the physics community really ought to respond to. And so what the, he then goes on to say is that if you want to get the most active, most innovative, and most rapid moving science, diversity drives higher levels of innovation. There are decades of research that proves that. But the Chief Justice is demonstrating that ignorance that I just showed on the previous slide as well. That's the end of my, uh, my spiel. Uh, thank you. If you're interested in learning more, this is our, a link to our, our webpage where we talk about a lot of these things and do a lot of professional development. And uh, I hope that wasn't too bad of an introduction to critical race theory for you. Uh, but thank you.